a special welcome to all of you uh, who are visiting online, tuning in online. Uh, you know, we, we do, we're kind of reach people in all sorts of different places uh, in these days. Listen, b- before I preach, um, Pastor Gary was just uh, praying in obviously that, that horrific um, earthquake uh, that happened this week. Uh, we have already, as a church, released uh, some funds through uh, ERDO, which is uh, through the PAOC Emergency uh, Relief Development Overseas. And so uh, they are on the ground right now providing just basic uh, care aid, uh, just being the hands and feet of Jesus in the midst of tragedy. And so uh, we've already given something as a church, but we, we just wanted to invite you uh, into this as well. If you wanted to give something special, uh, towards this, we will receive those funds, and every dollar that you give uh, towards that, we will just send it on uh, along the way. Uh, probably the easiest way that you can do that is we have these safe giving stations all around the back. If you just get an envelope in front of you, write a check, put some money in there, and just write on the envelope, uh, turkey, earthquake, uh, something that, that would just help us know that that's uh, designated funds for that. But uh, together as a church, we can... Uh, really help in very practical ways. So there's that. All right. Um, We are going to, as uh, Shannon just said in the video, today we're going to be concluding our sermon series on DNA, uh, Parkwood's DNA. I I guess I'll start here. In the 1950s, there was an... uh, there was this exhibition baseball game between the Milwaukee Braves and the New York Yankees. I I shared this here uh, probably about five years ago, but it's this uh, amazing story. Uh, The the power hitter of the Milwaukee Braves was a guy by the name of Hank Aaron. And uh, what he did is he stepped up to the plate this one day, and the the back catcher was a guy by the name of Yogi Berra. Uh, Yogi, if you don't know the sport of baseball that well, sometimes what will happen is the back catcher kind of chirps and tries to get in the ear of the batter. So Yogi, on this day, says to Hank Aaron, he says, Hank, I hear that you are so dumb. In fact, that you're, that you're as dumb as the day is long. In fact, you're so dumb that, that I don't even think you could read the words on your bat. So the pitcher releases a fastball, swing and a miss, strike one. Yogi thinks this is pretty awesome. So he keeps it up, Hank, you are as dumb as the day is long. In fact, you're so dumb that you can't even read the insignia on your bat. The pitcher releases another fastball, Hank, this time connects in fury, sending it towering over the back fence for a home run. He rounds first, second, third, comes home. And as he's on his way to the dugout, Hank turns around and says, hey, Yogi. He says, I didn't come here to read. (laughs) (laughs) He said, I came here to hit home runs. You see, here's a man who knew his purpose. Here's a man who knew why he was there, and he refused to let anyone or anything distract him from his purpose to hit home runs. The question, Parkwood, is why are we here? What's the purpose of it all. How do we hit home runs? Well, Jesus uh, gives a very clear answer to this in Matthew chapter 5, verse 14 in the Sermon on the Mount. He says this, you are the light of the world. A town on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds. Watch it now. See it. And glorify your Father in heaven. Park with the purpose of your life isn't to binge watch Netflix. I know, someone just got really sad. The purpose of your life isn't to become famous or powerful or rich. The purpose of your life, how we hit home runs, is by giving God glory. The final message in this DNA series, we've been using these kind of value statements, the building blocks of who we are. Here's our last one, if you're taking notes. God's glory is our goal. When we, as a church, 
gather, when we as the church assemble, we assemble with one simple goal, and that is to bring glory to the name of God. God's glory is our goal. Now, um, I just want to Lay, kind of like lay my cards on the table and just before I, I, I teach this message, I, I just want to be honest and acknowledge that a message like this to give in a, about a 30-minute window is incredibly frustrating. Like, it's difficult. And, and here's why. The word glory is a mega theme in the scriptures. Mega theme, all the way from Genesis to Revelation. And the word gets used in all sorts of different ways, and it's applied in different settings. And it's this really unique, deep topic. And so the reality is, no matter what I do today, I'm only going to be scratching the surface. So like, if you come up to me at the end of this message, you're like, man, Danny, I just don't think you, you covered this one. I'm like, man, I agree. Okay, I just want you to know right now, I'm not covering this topic. Okay, all that I can do in our time together is, is scratch the surface, like the glory of God. In fact, if I preached this every single week until the day that I die, I'm scratching the surface. The, the depths of the glory of God are, are just something that honestly most of us can't even fathom. Like, like, he is that big and great. And so today, w- what I want to do, and, I, and I've worked hard this week uh, to lay this out in a way that we can begin to grapple with. So I'm going to give you the framework right now of my message, and then I'll try to fill it in. Today, I want to talk about the reality of glory, the problem of glory, and then we'll close by just asking, is there a solution to the problem? Okay, so the reality, the problem, and then the solution. You ready to go? Okay, here we go. The reality of glory. Okay, what is the reality of glory? The the reality is this, that God deserves it. That's the reality. Uh, Whether we see it or not, whether we feel it or not, whether we acknowledge it or not, the reality is that God deserves it. Like, whatever it is, it's his. However we define it, it belongs to him. So how do we define it? Well, in the Greek New Testament, uh, which is what most of the New Testament was written in, Koine Greek, the word for glory is doxa. Let me hear you say doxa. Doxa, uh, the definition is this, to bring praise or honor or to marvel at something. I was kind of caught on that word marvel. I was thinking about um, the Marvel franchise. The mo- How many people here, by a show of hands, have, have seen a Marvel movie? <laughs> Some of you are like, I don't know if I should raise my hand right now. <laughs> you know, interesting, the Marvel franchise, the most successful movie franchise in history, they've made close to $30 billion. Uh, that's our money uh, that we pay to go sit in a theater in the dark and stare at a screen. But, but they named themselves very appropriately, right? Because the, the, the thought behind it was that these characters were Spider-Man, Ant-Man, Black Panther, like all these, the Avengers, all these, right? The idea is that, is that we could come and we could marvel at how amazing somebody is if they get bitten by a spider and can swing, right? Like, like th- that's, that's the picture. But it's not just in the movies we watch, it's the celebrities who fill those movies. We glory and marvel at the celebrities for how beautiful they are. We, we glory and marvel at the politicians for how smart they are. Sometimes. <laughs> Sorry, that was, move on, Danny. Um, we glory and we marvel at, 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 okay, it's Super Bowl tonight, at athletes, because someone's happy, because they could throw a football a little bit better than the next guy. And listen, I'm a football guy. I like the sport of football. But, but, but the reality is you've got all these sorts of things from the celebrities to uh, the movies to the politicians to the athletes and, and all these people. And we sit back and we, and we marvel. And, and there's nothing wrong with appreciating God's greatness. But, but, but here's, here, here, here's, here's my point is this, that yes, God gifts different people in different ways. True marvel, true glory belongs to God and God alone. 
only to him. Turn with me in your Bibles to Isaiah chapter 40. I, I want to show you this. God speaks through the prophet Isaiah to communicate his glory. Uh, everyone should just go home today and memorize Isaiah 40. It's a phenomenal chapter. We'll pick it up in verse 12. It says this, Who has measured the waters in the hollow of his hand? Or with the breadth of his hand marked off the heavens? Who has held the dust of the earth in a basket or weighed the mountains on the scales and the hills in a balance? You go down to verse 25. To whom will you compare me? Or who is my equal, says the Holy One? Lift up your eyes to the heavens. Who created all these? It's he who brings out the starry host one by one and calls forth each of them by name. Oh, that's good. Isaiah just told us that our God is so glorious that he can hold all the waters of the earth in the palm of his hand. For a reference point, I can't even palm a basketball, okay? It says that he sweeps up all the dust and sand of earth and puts it in a basket. The Sahara the Arabian, and every other desert plain and beach on earth. The mountains, K2, Everest, the Rockies, Himalayas, are but ounces to him. He weighs them on scales. Oh, and then there's the stars. <laughs> the trillions upon trillions of stars in the sky. God says, yeah, who brings those out? Me. And I know every single one by name. Parkwood, marvel. Our God is in a class of his own. No one can stand toe-to-toe with him or see eye-to-eye with him. He is, he is glorious, marvelous, wondrous. I mean, this is who our God is. The reality of glory is that he deserves it. Now, honestly, I, I, get, I could probably do a whole series on this one point, but I want to try to give us a, a broader understanding. we got to go a little bit deeper this morning and not just talk about the reality of glory, but we need to talk about the problem. The reality is that God deserves it. The problem is this, that we crave it. Hmm. We crave what God has. We long, desire somewhere inside of us for people to see us as beautiful and smart, strong, influential, powerful, right? Like, like we, we crave glory. And there's a word for this in the Bible. It's the word pride. Pride is spiritual plagiarism. Pride is taking credit for what God has done and not citing the source. Pride is us wanting to be little gods. And this is quite, quite, quite honestly, this is the problem of humanity. Pride. You know, as I was writing this, I was actually thinking of uh, Muhammad Ali. Muhammad Ali, if you don't know who that is, one of the greatest boxers of all time, but he was also a man who notably struggled with his own pride. I, I, I was reading this story about Ali. He was, he was up in a plane with a whole bunch of people, and the plane was hitting some severe turbulence. And so, ding, the little light comes on, fasten your seatbelt. So everybody races to put their seatbelt on, except Ali. Well, the flight attendant sees this, so she goes over, doesn't want to embarrass him, so just says, like, quietly, like, Mr. Ali, you know, would you please fasten your, your seatbelt? At which point, apparently, he audaciously announced for the whole plane to hear, Superman don't need no seatbelt. <laughs> and then she responded, well, Superman didn't need no airplane either. <laughs> <laughs> called pride, <laughs> glory, hunger, right? We crave what God has. 
Uh, go with me to Genesis chapter 3. We're going to hop around this morning to a few different places. Genesis 3, one of the most famous stories in the entire Bible. This is where it all goes bad. Genesis 3, let's read verse 1. It says, Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the other wild animals that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God really say that you must not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, We may eat from the trees in the garden, but God did say you must not eat from the fruit from the tree that's in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it or you will die. You will certainly not die, the serpent said to the woman, for God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be opened and you will be, watch it now, you will be like God, knowing good from evil. And we know what happens next, right? After the devil appeals to their pride, appeals to their hunger for glory, they disobey and everything has been spiraling out of control ever since. The reality of glory is that God deserves it. The problem of glory is that we crave it. And what's even worse is not just that we crave it, but at times we are ready and willing to receive it. If you flip over with me to Acts chapter 12, we're going from Genesis, Old Testament, New Testament, Acts 12. I want to show you the demise of King Herod. And just listen to these words. Acts 12, 21. It says, On the appointed day, Herod, wearing his royal robe, sat on the throne and delivered a public address to the people. They shouted, This is the voice of a God, not a man. Immediately, because Herod did not give praise to God, an angel of the Lord struck him down, and he was eaten by worms and died. Whew. Our problem is not that we just crave it. At times, we are willingly ready to receive it. It's called pride. And this is not just the problem with Adam and Eve or King Herod or Muhammad Ali. This is a problem that plays itself out all the time. Tim Keller, one of the most brilliant minds alive right now, says that pride is the sin beneath every other sin. C.S. Lewis says that pride leads to every other vice. Why? Well, like I said last week, what the Bible says is that our hearts are wickedly uh, deceitful and cannot be trusted. And that is true. Like, this is the human condition. Our hearts are busted. They lie to us all the time, but that is only part of the story. You go over to the prophet Ezekiel, and he will actually say this, that God gives us heart transplants. Now, what God does is he, he removes our heart of stone, and he gives us a heart of flesh. Like, what God has the power to do is actually change our desires. Like, how amazing is that? So the question is, how does he do this? How does God change our desires? Well, the answer is through worship. The reality of glory is that God deserves it. The problem of glory is that we crave it. So what's the solution? The solution is that we must worship. You got to see it, Parkwood. Worship is responding with all that we are, mind, emotion, and will to the revelation of God. Worship is getting our eyes off of ourselves and onto our creator. Worship is the solution to the problem. You see, there, there's a piece of this glory puzzle that we haven't talked about yet, and it's probably my favorite part. And it's this, that not only is God glorious, that is true, but what you need to understand is this, that he is also after the praise of his glorious name. What God desires is a church that will worship. What God desires is a bride that will actually love him. And like, and honestly, like, l let me tell you why this is the best news ever. Like ever, because if this is true, that God is not only glorious, but, but he's actually after the praise of his glorious name, then what that means is that he's not after our begrudging submission, but rather our joy. If, it's, if this is what God wants, genuine 
glory, genuine worship, a genuine love from the church, worship, adoration. If this is what God wants, then what that means is that when the church gathers, he's not after weekly robotic routines, but rather a a bride. Like that's what the church is called, right? A bride, but rather a bride that loves the groom. This is what God is after. And, and it's, it's so beautiful. And this is woven. I'll just cite some things. Isaiah 43 says this, that God created us for his glory. Psalm 106, God rescued Israel from Egypt for his glory. 1 Samuel 12, God did not cast away his people for the glory of his name. John 14, Jesus says that he answers prayer so that God will be glorified. John 16, the ministry of the Holy Spirit is to glorify the Son of God. Or 1 Corinthians 10 just kind of sums it all up. says whether you're eating or drinking or anything else that you find yourself doing, do it to the glory of God. What God is after, he is glorious, and he is after the praise of his glorious name. I want you to hear me. A life in the pursuit of the glory of God is the only place that your pleasure and joy and fulfillment will ever be found. I did not say that a life in the pursuit of the glory of you, a life in the pursuit of the glory of God is the only place (laughs) that our pleasure and fulfillment will ever be found. See, this took me a long time to fully grasp, but the beauty of worship, the beauty of worship is that it's not just one-sided where we send glory up. It's actually a two-sided thing where God sends his glory down. It's a relationship. Uh, And this is woven through the scriptures. I mean, you go into the Old Testament and you see the Israelites, right? They finally left Egypt and they're in the wilderness and Once they got their tabernacle constructed, what's the first thing that happens? God was so eager to dwell with his people. In Exodus 40, it says that the glory of the Lord came and filled the tabernacle. On the very night that Jesus was born, some hundreds of years later, right? There were shepherds, Luke 2 tells us, out in a field, and an angel appears, uh, appears uh, to the shepherds. But then it says this, that the glory, not of the angel, but the glory of the Lord began to shine around them. 33 years after that, Jesus ascends back up into heaven, but tells his followers, don't you even think about lifting a finger in, in my name until you've received the Holy Spirit. So they they go into a season of worship, responding to God with all that they are, mind, emotion, will. They're praying, they're seeking the Lord, and it was in that place that the glory of the Lord descended. The Holy Spirit fell like a nuclear bomb (laughs) over everyone who was present. You see, the, the picture is not just that we worship and we give something to God, but it's actually through this that God begins to give something back to us. His presence. <laughs> His presence. You know, you got to see the picture. There is a glory that is given and there is also a glory that is received. I shared this story um, a couple times here. Uh, I told my wife, this morning, that I, I think it was this morning, that I'm telling this story, and she just rolled her eyes at me. Because uh, she's, she's heard me not only preach it here, but at other churches and different things. But listen, if you've heard this story before, just nod along like it's the first time you've heard it. Because it's one of the best ones I've got, and it's going to illustrate my point, okay? Worship team, come on back up. You've got you to help me here. Okay. Um, years ago, we used to uh, do these missions trips out of the church here to uh, First Nations Reserves. Uh, we spent 12 years doing this, sending teams. Uh, in one of the years that we were up there, uh, we were invited. They, they came to us and said, hey, it's, it's Canada Day. We're going to do this big celebration. We wanna, we're going to go light some fireworks off at the beach. Do you want to come? So I thought, yeah, that sounds great. You know, I understand fireworks. I've been to the Windsor, Detroit. How many people here have ever been to the, to the River Fireworks? Yeah, isn't it beautiful? 
like uh, a lot of money goes into it. There, like everything, like there's a lot of like reason and uh, everything's like co- goes off at the right time. And so they invite us. I'm like, yeah, I, I, I get fireworks. I know how they work. And so we went down to the beach that night. And um, what I found out was this was nothing like the Windsor Detroit fireworks at all. Uh, what they had was what, I, what looked like a bunch of like Folgers coffee tins. You know what I'm talking about? And they would stick them in the sand and then they packed the tins with fireworks and then with a torch, they would just come and light the can on fire. Honestly, it was amazing. Like there was no rhyme, rhythm, or reason to what was happening. You know, at like the Windsor one, how like right at the very end, there's the grand finale where it's just like... Every moment was the grand finale at this beach. Like, I'm not kidding. It was just the best thing ever. And then all of a sudden, something happened that uh, I've never experienced before and still haven't since. And it was this, that one of those tins of fireworks tipped over and started shooting fireballs into the crowd. Like, I'm not making this up. There was a lot of people that were there. You can ask uh, people in our church still that were there with me that day. Literally, like, like a fireball, the closest one came to me was probably about four feet away and just like, like, like people were running for their lives. <laughs> it was the best firework show I've ever been to. <laughs> it was amazing. But it, it really got me thinking about how we approach our relationship with God. <laughs> I think for a lot of us, if you juxtapose those two things, you, you put the Windsor fireworks with the First Nations one, and we would say, oh, well, I, I, I want the Windsor one because at the Windsor one, I can stand at a safe distance away and I can look up in the sky and I can say, ooh, ah, isn't that wonderful? And now listen, at some level, that's needed. Marvel. We need to be able to look up to God and to say, Wow. <laughs> You are so much bigger and stronger and greater than I could ever understand. That is needed, but it doesn't stop there. What God wants is not just the, he, he, he's not just glorious. He's, he's after the praise of his name. He's after this intimate encounter. He's after a bride that will love him. I'll just say it this way. Every now and then, what God wants to do is he just wants to shoot a fireball in our face. The psalmist said, oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. That's an experience, isn't it? Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. I love the Apostle Paul who wrote, he said, I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection. He doesn't say, I want to know about Christ. He doesn't say, give me another class. Give me another textbook. Give me another teaching. No, 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 he says, I want to know him. I want to experience him. I want to be in a relationship with him. The reality of glory is that God deserves it. The problem of glory is that we crave it and we're so ready and willing to receive what is his. So what's the solution? The solution is this, worship getting our eyes off of ourselves and onto our creator. Park with this is in our DNA. We are nothing without him in his presence, nothing. And I just believe as we move forward, we've got a lot of exciting things as a church moving. We were, we're, we're looking out how to reach this city more missionally, but we, We cannot do the mission at the expense of worship. In fact, let let, let me read you a quote from John Piper. He says this. He says, missions 
is not the ultimate goal of the church. Worship is. Missions exist because worship doesn't. Worship is ultimate, not missions, because God is ultimate, not man. When this age is over and the countless millions of the redeemed fall on their faces before the throne of God, missions will be no more. It is a temporary necessity, but worship abides forever. Now listen, those who know me or have been around for the past years, like you know, like we're a missions church. Literally this week, we were signing papers, the transfer of ownership of this property to, to plant a church in the downtown of Windsor. Like, like we are a church with a mission, but the mission is not just to feed hungry people or clothe the naked or love the lonely. Yes, that's all aspects of it. The mission is that so people could go and see the glory of God and begin to worship. That's the mission. Missions exist because worship doesn't. Right now, there are people all around our city, our world, that, that yeah, they're worshiping lowercase worship themselves or athletes or stuff, but like true worship is absent from so many people. Missions is not ultimate, worship is. Because God is ultimate, not man. And what he's calling us into in this next season is to be a church that recognizes his glory and worships him for all he is worth. Can we stand on up to our feet? God's glory is our goal. When we gather as a church, it's in our DNA as a faith family to bring glory to God. He deserves it. He deserves it all. Now listen, this, this glory of God, this other piece, just really quick about like the glory descending, I need to be abundantly clear. We can't manufacture this. We can't manipulate God. There's no twisting of his arm to make him show up in a, in a unique manifest way. All that we can do is position ourselves under the waterfall of God's grace through worship because it is through worship that God gets what he deserves and we get what we don't deserve, his glory, his presence all around us. So church, we're gonna sing. And listen, I, I know we all got stuff to do. We got different things out there. I am telling you right now, there is nothing more important outside of these walls than what's happening in here right now. Right now, I feel it in my bones that God is calling his bride back to his side. So listen, church, I want to just encourage you as we sing, who cares what you look like? Who cares what somebody else is thinking across the room? All that matters is God. We worship, we live, we sing for an audience of one. So church, may worship arise in the house and may we give glory to the one who deserves it.